I want to welcome in now Tim Haggerty. He is the voice of the El Paso Chihuahuas, the AAA affiliate of the San Diego Padres. He's been doing that for a decade. Tim, thanks for being with us. How are you? Great, Brady. Thanks for having me. Well, you are, you're welcome. You are a really appropriate guest to have at this time because in the last episode that came out last week, I spent a lot of time talking about Fernando Tatis Jr. in a couple of different ways. And you, he is rehabbing right now, rehabbing in quotes, working his way back from his PED suspension. He's eligible to come back in just a couple of days here on April 20th. And you've been calling his games. First and foremost, how does he look physically? He's played great. Um, and as you mentioned, with it being a suspension, he's not coming back from an injury, at least not immediately. He had a wrist injury in 2022. But yeah, he's reaching base close to 60% of the time with El Paso and a handful of games. As a home run, he's showing power. He's stolen two bases. He's made some great throws in the outfield. You know, a lot of people think of him as a shortstop, but remember, he's going to be the Padres' right fielder now. They acquired Xander Bogart, so uh, he's adjusted well. And from someone with the Padres that I spoke to, they're just amazed at how quickly he adjusted to becoming an outfielder. Just his his gift, his athleticism, uh, he's looking like an all-star in the outfield. I have several questions about kind of how he will reassimilate to major league life, and maybe you've gotten – um, a little bit of this, you know, firsthand knowledge by being around him. I guess the first thing I'm wondering is how is he going to be welcomed back to baseball? And, you know, look, I think the 2017 Astros have a permanent stain on them. Altuve is going to be booed everywhere he goes. But I've largely thought that the PED guys lately have kind of just reassimilated no problem. Like you wouldn't even know that Nelson Cruz was suspended for PEDs at this point. Robinson Cano was the leader of the Dominican World Baseball Classic team, and he's been popped twice for PEDs. In the minors, has it been kind of seamless for Tatis when it comes to fanfare, kind of picking up where he left off? That's a great question. For the home games in El Paso, they're just so excited that one of the top few players in baseball is here playing for their home team, town team. So he was welcomed with great cheers in El Paso. Uh, I think a more accurate test to your question was on the road. El Paso played games at Sacramento, a Giants affiliate, and it was interesting. It was almost like they were indecisive. When he was first introduced, there were cheers. But mid-game, when he came up as a batter, I'd say it was 50-50. There was some booing. There was some jeering. There were some, you know, words shouted at him like cheater. Um, so it's interesting. And, and I was on a San Diego sports radio show, and they asked me that same question. And I said that Sacramento, it felt like the fans were indecisive. Hmm. And they laughed, and they said, so are people in San Diego. That, I mean, this guy was and for a lot of people still is revered he's this talented generational type player he's cool he's got swagger he's on both sides of the ball they just love that this guy was a padre he signs a 14-year deal he's going to be a padre forever um most people i think are so excited for his return but there are some people that felt disappointed they felt let down by this guy that as far as fandom they idolized so I think that in road ballparks, he will hear some boos. But Nelson Cruz is the example. The, the player you brought up is what I was going to bring up. He's looked at as one of the classiest players in mm -hmm. baseball. And people have forgotten that he was once suspended for PEDs. Remember how he used to smile at Bartolo Colon? Yeah, right. Uh, exactly. Bartolo Colon had, had that as part of his past. So I think in the long term, he can regain that. And I think in San Diego, he'll remain popular. But I do think in, in some road ballparks it'll be mixed maybe it's unfair to ask you because you're not in san diego so maybe it's not a question maybe it's more of a conversation point i i wonder how he'll come back into the clubhouse because one it's a different clubhouse than he left it's a team that's since acquired juan soto and has brought in xander bogart so there's a different dynamic and he may not be the leader in that clubhouse that he once was, given there's more veteran presence there and guys like jake cronenworth who have signed more long-term deals but also just how his teammates view him. Do they view him as, hey, we're excited to have this guy back. He could be the missing piece. Or do they look, do they look at him and say, you're the reason we didn't get to the World Series last year and you were the piece we should have had a year ago. I think the clubhouse dynamic is going to be interesting to at least monitor. I think one evidence we have on that so far is Joe Musgrove, who's known as a very hard worker, very diligent with his body, with his training. He's currently with El Paso on a rehab assignment and we see that. And Musgrove, quite openly last year to the San Diego media. I think the phrase was pissed off, said, I'm pissed off at him. I'm disappointed. I'm upset. Uh, it was, I think, an emotional time for a lot of people, especially the veterans at San Diego when the suspension was announced late last summer. But now you fast forward to the winter. 
The San Diego Union Tribune did this long profile on Joe Musgrove and his rigorous training and how it involves a swimming pool and holding his breath. And he's training, he's training with uh, people with a military past. Mm. And with him in the training was Fernando Tatis Jr. Um, so I think as far as the clubhouse, my perception, people I talked to, is that last summer there was some tension, but that since then he has been welcomed back. It's interesting you mentioned Joe Musgrove because I spent one year working in minor league baseball for the Tri City Valley Cats, and I was kind of their film guy. When they, you know they're an Astros affiliate, they were an Astros affiliate before the uh, restructuring of minor league baseball. And Joe Musgrove was playing for the Tri City Valley Cats before he got traded to Pittsburgh. Wow. Uh, I want to say in the Garrett Cole deal, if I'm remembering correctly. Right. Yeah. But uh, Joe Musgrove, there, low A ball. He was awesome. He was incredible to just watch pitch the way he attacked the strike zone. You could see his stuff was that good, even at low A ball. So I love watching Joe Musgrove. I agree with you. Yeah, I saw him at AAA Fresno when they were an Astros affiliate. And I agree. He fit the part body-wise, training. You could tell he was so competitive. Uh, the Padres have a AAA pitching coach here, Scott Mitchell, who was with the Pirates when they traded for Musgrove. And he said that's what we loved about him was <laughs> the makeup. You know, he almost took like a football player's mentality to the mound. Um, was fierce. One other question I have on Tatis is I think sometimes when you do something wrong, you're kind of on your best behavior for a while. And then eventually, once you kind of feel comfortable, you can start to, to voice your opinion on things again. So what I'm wondering is, is right now Tatis is now playing right field, as you mentioned, and I bet he's perfectly okay with that. I want to get back any way I can to help the team, you know, anything I can do to make amends. I wonder if come July, August, September, he looks around going, that should be me at shortstop. That was my spot. I should have been there for 14 years. And now it's not mine. And now I'm a little upset. What's kind of your, your sense on his attitude about being in the outfield? I think that he's working hard to be the best outfielder in the majors. Um, so I wouldn't see that happening. And, and it's interesting, your first observation when somebody's coming back from a suspension, how they're on their best behavior. I'll tell you this, Fernando Tatis Jr., from what I've seen, in the six games he's played, he has signed autographs for kids before all six, mm. home or road. In that same ballpark in Sacramento that half the people were booing him, he was there signing, smiling, doing the selfies. Uh, from what I understand, at Padres Fan Fest, he was accessible to media. He was great, a lot of smiles. Um, it's kind of reminded me that it's complicated. I think, you know, sometimes good talk show hosts like you, you want to compact an argument into one segment. Mm -hmm. When it comes to performance enhancing drugs, I've kind of learned there is a lot of gray. Um, there was an El Paso pitcher years ago. This guy would be the first one to sign up to go out in the community, help homeless people or whatever the, the charitable event was. He had two young kids and was just so kind to them. Uh, and this guy had failed multiple PED tests in the past. Um, you know, are, are all Wall Street people that swindle people out of money, are they bad people? Or mm -hmm. did they give in to a temptation and feel a rush to try and get an edge? Um, I don't know about you, but I mean, to me, maybe as I get older, things like this become a little more complicated. Yeah. So I've kind of been around Tatis. I, I think he's frankly, maybe a nicer guy than I would have pictured the way I see him interacting with fans. Let's move off Tatis and talk about your career. You just wrote a book too. I want to get to here momentarily, but a decade with El Paso, you've seen some of the top prospects in baseball. I'm curious about kind of your prospect memories, guys that you've got a chance to see guys that have stood out to you over your decade there at the, uh, at the Padres affiliate level. Yeah, and I've been lucky. I've been with the Padres AAA affiliate even back to 2008 when they were in previous locations. They've been building that farm system for a long time, so you've seen a lot of good yes. Padres players uh, in their own right, just them. And what's interesting is the Padres are so active with acquiring players via trade and free agency that a lot of the best AAA players I've seen are now starring elsewhere. Ty France, who's a major league all-star with Seattle, was an outstanding hitter with uh, Brady's Padres. That's my guy right there. That, I'm okay. a Mariners fan, diehard Mariners fan. Oh, so. okay. All the Padres guys that the Mariners have gotten, uh, I'm a fan of, but uh, definitely a, a Ty France guy. Ty France is the author of my my best prediction ever. Predictions are hard. I'm usually bad at them. <laughs> but in 2019, we were doing this preview show. Ty France was 
on the El Paso Chihuahuas AAA opening day roster. And I said, I think Ty France will be the MVP of the Pacific Coast League, which was a 16-team league. And the reason I thought that was that he made contact a lot. He didn't strike out a lot for a power hitter. So he's going to get the ball in play. And in the Pacific Coast League, when we have high elevated stadiums, this is a really good league to hit in. He played third base and first base at the time, and that was occupied at the time by the two most established, highest-paid Padres, Manny Machado and Eric Cosmer. So I thought, this guy's going to be here for a while. Yeah. He was. He won MVP of the league. Um, and since then with Seattle, has become a major league all-star. Good guy, down to earth. And he's an amazing story. He was like a 34th-round pick. There was literally, San Diego State. Yeah, yeah. There was more than 1,000 players drafted before him. Anyone could have had him. And they kept saying, no, thanks. Uh, so he comes to mind as somebody that we've seen in El Paso. Hunter Renfro was a great player mm. here who has been in the Angels now. Um, been with the Braves, right? Hitting a lot of majors. Um, you know, and to me, Brady, the most fun stories are the guys maybe that weren't expected to make it. There's a player from New England, Matthew Batten, currently with El Paso. Mm. This guy was like a 37th round pick out of Quinnipiac. He's smaller, plays a variety of positions. And for a couple of years, he was what they – unofficially call an organizational player. He'd go and fill in at single A when they needed a second baseman for a week. Okay, well, somebody got hurt at double A. You're going to go be their third baseman for a week. He's just bouncing around the organization, filling in. Did so well with that that the Padres thought, well, maybe we have something here. And last year played in the major leagues. Wow. Um, yeah, made it up for a, a good San Diego Padres team. So love that. Cold weather state, smaller guy. The odds were very much against him. And he played it in the majors. That's a pretty incredible story, too. Um, I wanted to ask you about the pitch clock. Not so much from the the impact standpoint. We're seeing what the impact is at the major league level. I'm curious, on the broadcasters, what the pitch clock has been like in terms of trying to get stories in quickly and get kind of in and out of stories. And I've seen a lot of times at major league games this year where broadcasters will start a story and then they'll have to stop it and bring it back next inning, and they can't quite figure out how to get it, how to get into it. What's it like from the broadcaster's perspective? So the pitch clock came to AAA in 2015, but it really wasn't enforced. They decided in 2022, we really got to enforce this because we're thinking about applying it to the majors in 2023. So we have to study the results. So early in 2022, the first few games, it took an adjustment. It kind of felt like things were in fast forward. But then you got used to it. And my first season broadcasting baseball was 2004. And the truth is the time between pitches and the time between balls in play and the time of game is pretty similar to what it was then. So eventually you realize, oh yeah, we used to do this without the clock. This is what it used to look like. Um, but yeah, at first, certainly an adjustment. I have no doubt that by midsummer, players, broadcasters, fans will grow used to this. And I think it's a great positive thing for the game, the way that recent trends were developing that were not positive. Um, over time, it's like, you don't even notice the clock is there until there's an infraction. And I totally understand fans that aren't used to this and they don't like an automatic strikeout being called against a guy with two strikes. But Theo Epstein, who now works with Major League Baseball on the implementation of a lot of these new rules, he put it great in an interview the other day. He said, I've never heard of a fan leaving an NFL game and saying, that was a great, entertaining back and forth game. But, you know, that delay of game penalty in the second quarter really bothered me. <laughs> That's a good point. You know, at, what, at what point do we accept this is a rule and that if there's a violation against a player, that it's the player's fault and not the rule's fault? Are we also seeing the challenge system when it comes to balls and strikes? Is this AAA right now, right, where we got the, the weekend, we got different rules than we have during the week? Explain to me what's going on here and what your perception is. Yeah, last year – in the Pacific Coast League, every game, every pitch was called by the automatic ball strike system. The Hawkeye system, a set of... And the three. home plate umpire is still there, but he's essentially there just to call plays at the plate? Well, and he's still telling the fans what's a ball and what's a strike. He's gotcha. just receiving it via his earpiece. Okay. But yeah, when people say, like, robot umpires, and that it might cost people jobs, that part's absolutely not true, because there is more... MLB employees in a AAA ballpark today than there's ever been. In fact, this hmm. is adding jobs. There's somebody at field level. There's somebody in the press box to make sure these systems are working. But there's high-definition cameras that are calling balls and strikes, and the umpire physically hears the word ball or strike in his earpiece. 
I say his just because in AAA there are all male umpires. There are female umpires elsewhere in baseball. Um, but yeah, now, depending on the day of the week, it's either that system or the challenge system, which is where teams get three challenges per game. They must be done instantly. You can't look to the dugout for a cue. And it must be done by the pitcher, catcher, or batter. And they do it by tapping their helmet. And it's different than replaying a play in the majors. There's nobody walking over to put on a headset. The umpire hears it instantly and is able to instantly say whether it was a ball or a strike. Mm -hmm. And the reason they're splitting up the week, the first rule I mentioned is Monday through Thursdays. And then the challenge system is in place only on Friday, Saturday, Sundays. Because a lot of AAA umpires are also going up and filling in in the majors. And they didn't want an umpire to go to the major leagues having not called balls and strikes hmm. for three months. So rather than, you know, experimenting and saying the first half of the season, we're doing this and the second half we're doing this, they divide it up to make sure the umpires are still getting reps on seeing balls and strikes. The one thing I'm curious about when you talk about the automated strike zone system, or even in the challenge system, is it called a strike if it touches any part of the theoretical box or does it have to be majority of the ball inside the box? Or like if it just touches the bottom corner of the strike zone, it's called a strike. Cause those pitches, they might touch the corner, but they often don't look like strikes to us. It's a completely accurate observation on the corners. And apparently what MLB has found is that the rule book strike zone is a rectangle, but apparently umpires what they call is actually more of an oval. So what happened last year in AAA is that the calls that were being argued were the ones that were in the four corners of the strike zone, where, you know, last year that pitch actually is a ball low and outside, but actually it did clip the strike zone. So anytime the ball touches even a corner of the strike zone, they call it a strike. And what they also found was the catcher's setup was having a lot to do with what's a ball and what's a strike. Major League Baseball did a cool thing. They put iPads in the dugouts because they didn't want the players to start yelling at this, you know, robotic unquote umpire. The iPads actually would show the players, well, it actually was a strike. And one of the examples that major league baseball used was a catcher who was setting up inside on a right-handed batter. And there was a breaking ball from a right-handed pitcher that went low and away. And the catcher lunges across and backhands it. And when I saw the video, I thought, no way, that's not a strike. That's a terrible call. But you, when you look at where the ball actually crossed the plate, it was a strike. Mm. It's just that, you know, visually for fans, when you see a catcher lunge over, normally that's not a strike. But that's another thing it, it would take away is pitch framing, where that call is a ball or a strike even before it reaches the catcher. Tim, I'll get you out of here on this. You just wrote this book, Tales from the Dugout, 1001 Humorous, Inspirational, and Wild Anecdotes from Minor League Baseball. It came out uh, at the end of March, and uh, so it's out now here for a couple of weeks. Talk to me about the inspiration behind it and some of your favorite stories from, uh, from Minor League Baseball. I've always loved researching baseball history, and in 2012, when I was researching something else, I came across this story from the 1880s that a Texas League game was delayed when a wild bull ran on the field. <laughs> and I thought, well, I've never heard this story before. So the odds are most fans haven't either. So 2012, that's what began collecting these crazy minor league stories. I would use newspaper archives. I made a research trip to the Baseball Hall of Fame library in Cooperstown. They were so helpful. Um, interviewed people, managers, players, scouts. So the 1,001 stories are from the present day, but they also go all the way back to the 1800s. There's a lot of visuals in the book. Um, as far as my, one of my favorites, this one will blow your mind. 1978, a double A Eastern League game. And there were some big players in this game. Bristol, Connecticut has Wade Boggs on the field. They're visiting Jersey City, New Jersey. Ricky Henderson is playing for Jersey hmm. City. And there's a fly ball hit to right field that vanished. It didn't go over the fence. It didn't land on the field. It didn't go in the stands. And the ball disappeared. And this sounds crazy, but I'm telling you, I talked to players who were on the field, and everyone describes it the same way. Everyone just kind of looked at each other saying, where did this ball go? So the umpires got together. By the way, it was a clear night. It wasn't like a foggy situation. The umpires get together. Understandably, they don't know what the rule is when a ball disappears. <laughs> so they gave the batter a double. 
Unbelievable. I wonder, uh, I've never spoken to Wade Box, but if I do, I know what the intro is. You were on the field in the 78 game where the ball disappeared so in the minors. So, uh, Tim, I assume we can get the book on Amazon and other usual suspects? Yeah, anywhere books are sold. You can get it on Amazon today. Again, Tales from the Dugout, 1001 Humorous, Inspirational, and Wild Anecdotes from Minor League Baseball. And uh, ask for it in your local bookstore if that's your style, too. There you go. Tim Haggerty, voice of the El Paso Chihuahuas, has been doing that gig for a decade, has been broadcasting here for nearly 20 years in general. Uh, Tim, and we appreciate the time and the perspective, and uh, we'll catch up down the road. Thank you, Brady.